these past 12 months have certainly been a roller coaster ride of emotions for many of us in the industry, and it's testament to your resilience that we come together today at the VMA Congress. Priava is once again proud to be the principal sponsor of the VMA Congress for the fourth year, as Michael said. We would like to thank Michael and his team for persevering and finding a way to make this Congress happen through a very, very turbulent year. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Priava has invested heavily in releasing a number of new features these past 12 months, including functionality to address match day premium ticketing, premium ticketing mobile access and dashboard reporting, to name but a few. Our focus remains to be the central source of insight for any venue wanting to optimise the utilisation of space and drive higher returns for any events on match day or non-match day events. Thank you for attending today and I look forward to talking with you during the course of the day. Enjoy the rest of the day. So let's kick off our first plenary session, uh, Building Positive Workplace Culture. This session is going to be facilitated by the wonderful Beck Barry. Beck is the Director of People and Culture at ASM Global Asia Pacific. Beck has held a number of senior positions across her career, including the establishment of the team to operate Sydney Australia, the Stadium Australia ahead of the Sydney Olympics in 2000. With venues live for a number of years, Beck was most recently the General Manager, Organisational Development based in Sydney, and prior to that relocated to Perth for two years and led the establishment, training and supervision of the permanent and casual teams of Optus Stadium. Beck spent 10 years at the Royal Agricultural Society of New South Wales as the General Manager, Human Resources, where she oversaw the successful development of the Sydney Royal Easter Show Event Volunteer Program. Beck has worked for the Rugby Football Union at Twickenham in London in hospitality and publishing industries. Her expertise spans recruitment, training, performance management, industrial relations, policy development and change management. Very well qualified for this topic. Please welcome Beck and she'll introduce her panel. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and welcome, everybody. I'm delighted that somebody's given me a headphone and a stage, so anything could happen this afternoon. Um, on behalf of the panel, we too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Gail Simons. Gail is a, um, passionate about creating a value for business by helping people develop greater capability and bringing different thinking to how they work. Gail ex has extensive experience working in corporate environments where diversity-based challenges were experienced regularly, and we've been talking about those, and she's going to share some of those with us today, um, particularly at, at Qantas, at Nortel, Singtel, Opio Singtel Optus, Jolique, Osgrid, and Nature's Care. Uh, she has degrees in sociology and psychology from Sydney Uni and a master's degree in organisation development from George Washington Uni, with her master's thesis being managing performance across culture. She's of Sri Lankan heritage and moved to Australia with her family at 17 years of age and has also lived and worked in Singapore. Due to her personal life experience, human resources background and track record of results, Gail is absolutely regarded as a leader in the area of diversity and inclusion. And my other partner in crime this afternoon is Piers Thompson, who is the Executive General Manager of Infrastructure and Strategy at the Australian Turf Club. Uh, with over 20 years' experience managing large-scale projects across a broad range of industries, Piers is currently leading and managing the planning and delivery of major projects to develop long-term sustainable cash flows to be invested in members, facilities, services and racing. Prior to working at the ATC, Piers was the CEO at PMY Group, uh, leading global projects. PMY Group is known to many of us uh, is a technology advisory investment and delivery company that specialises in sport and entertainment venues, public and private assets and major events globally. Piers was also the general manager of strategy and projects at the Sydney Cricket and Sports Ground Trust. Uh, he was responsible for the ongoing development and implementation of the trust master plan and broader ICT strategy across the precinct where he led the redevelopment of the Victor Trumper stand and the redevelopment of the Bradman Noble and Messenger stands, which won the project of the year in uh, 2015 in the business, uh, Stadium Business Awards in Barcelona. So 
Nice work. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of both of you. There's so much in there. It's building stuff. It's physical. It's people. And it's bringing all of that together to make great organisations. So in attracting people at the moment as we re-emerge, uh, what I'm finding is that people are... The brand is super important. But people are asking about culture. Candidates are saying, what's the culture like? You know, what, describe the culture in your organisation. So I'm interested to explore what workplace culture is and how do we know? What does it look like? How do we feel it? Piers, would you like to have a first crack at that? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Is that, I can um, hear you perfectly. Great. Firstly, apologies about my socks. Um, they're a bit loud looking in the, uh, in the mirror down here. But, um, they match your tie nicely. Yeah, yeah but good job. And yeah. thank you to VMA for, for putting this on and, um, and the delegates. And uh, it's challenging circumstances, we all know. But um, it's great to have everyone here. Um, I think it's important that we, you know, first and foremost, that you live by, by your values. And that's got to be part of the DNA yeah. um, when anyone's coming to work at a, uh, at a place of employment. They are looking now more and more around um, how, does, how does the organisation function? What's, what diff what's different from working here to working in another place which might be paying more or the same money? So what are those, those point of differences? So it's really important and, and as you said, more and more people are asking that d during interview processes yep. or after they've, um, you know, actually got the job. They're, they're seeking that sort of what is the culture, what are we doing around training and development and, and what are the company values. And so we've, at ATC in particular, have spent quite a lot of time over the past 12 months um, creating our values, which is around collaborate, care, own and bold. And and then making sure that we're genuine about implementation of those, of those values. Um, the environment in which you create is really important, and you know, the, whether that's infrastructure or staff facilities or workstations and, and all of that, it's all, it's all part of the parcel to um, that whole culture and, uh, and creating a, a, a good place to work. And, and probably lastly is around that uh, communication and interaction. Yeah. And that's got to be really genuine. It's, it can't be forceful. It can't be um, forced upon people. It's got to be part of your day-to-day -day, um, interaction. It's not about, well, we've got an engagement survey coming up. Let's, um, you know, let's really speak to the staff and communicate or set up yeah. uh, um, a staff-wide meeting and so forth. So those things in terms of how you're um, recognising or how it's being acknowledged is around that reward and recognition, yep. um, training and development, and, and turnover is probably a key indicator around uh, how much culture and, and um, you know, are you creating that good place, that nice place to work. And if you've got a, a high t turnover, You've obviously got to have a revisit and, yeah. and look at that because that be, could be part of it. Yeah. yeah. So the physical space is important. I think the physical space speaks a lot to culture and, and the way the place um, feels physically, but the feeling in the joint is also super important. So, Gail, what are your thoughts around how do we catch culture? Can we catch it? Uh, absolutely, we can catch it. And in the... Um, uh, to stay aligned with today's environment, with the pandemic, I'm going to say the leader is a super spreader. <laughs> um, so the leader absolutely is ground zero super spreader of culture. Right. Uh, if you look at um, principle one of how you build culture in a workplace, there's no getting around the fact that leaders create culture. Yep. So it begins and ends with us as leaders. Um, we, whether we do nothing as a leader or we do something, whether we say something or don't say something, we've created culture. Yep. Um, and we are, as a leader, the most infectious part of, the, <laughs> of the, what you catch. Um, if we get mathematical, we know that a tipping point is 33.3%. Um, um, so if the leader, a bit like the herd vaccine thing, if the leader um, yeah. infects 33% of the organization with their culture be yeah. toxic, or positive, yeah. that will tip the culture yeah. and it then spreads 
very rapidly uh, through the organization. Yeah. So for me, I guess the thought is if you are going to be the infecting point of the culture, and yes, you absolutely catch it through the Everybody. leader, then you may as well be in control of what it is that you're infecting people with. And so rather than that being something that a leader does unconsciously yep. um, and ends up inadvertently where they don't want to be with the toxic culture yep. accidentally, yep. they may as well design or construct the culture that you want and then happily infect yes. with the things that are going to make a difference. Yeah. That's beautiful, and I, I love that. I love that analogy. So that's, I think, what we're saying, though, is everybody here today, and that might be watching later. We're all infectious. Yes. We need to be really mindful of what it is we're taking out to our little communities, and and let's be super spreaders. Let's, let's be as, and, as leaders. And if I can add, how do I know I've infected positively? How do you know? Um, so you simply know because an employee will tell you, yep. and not only will they tell you, they'll tell others. Yep. So employee advocacy to me is the holy grail of infection as a leader of a positive culture. And if they not only tell each other, hey, this is a great place to be, if they're telling people at their kids' soccer match yep. or at a barbecue or when you're home somewhere and you're saying, hey, I work in a really great place yep. um, and I really love it, I love turning up, then you've infected positively. Yep. Conversely, if they turn up and tell others, so they're detractors, not advocates of a great place to work. Well, that's really bad for the leader because it's negative infection. Mm. And culturally, those employees will go around saying at the soccer match or the barbecue, I actually really don't like where I work. Yeah. It's not cool. I'm, I'm looking, yeah. uh, I'm not happy. Mm. So that is absolutely what we don't want when yeah. we're talking about a positive culture mm. and how you infect yeah. or catch. And we're particularly challenged at the moment because so much of our workforce has gone off to do other things while we've, while we've had this um, downturn. So we, we really do want to be promoting great places to work. We do. Um, in an industry that is um, sometimes a little bit antisocial and we, we operate while everybody else is having a, a good time, everything we can do to be bringing people back, getting the message out through our population is super important. Yes. Um, how do you see culture and values marrying up? Because sometimes they... What, as you were saying earlier, Pierce, the things that we're talking about don't actually play out in reality. How, do, how have you seen that marry up well? Um, yeah, both. I've seen it not marry up and marry up. So to me, values is a huge part of culture. And if, if culture is kind of the way we work, as Pierce mentioned, then values are the how. How we yeah. work and how it, it guide, is a guidepost to me of how I am. And if those values are comes off a poster and off a coffee cup or off a, what I call a sugar hit launch. Oh, yeah. So you do a launch and it's a bit of a sugar hit. Everyone gets excited for 10 minutes, you're rah rah up and then you kind of go back to being flat. Then that's where it's not married up. Yeah. But if the values become a lived experience, it's absolutely yeah. part of who you are every day. Um, you live them, you hardwire them in the organization. So by that I mean if it lives in the operating part of the business or, and I sit here as a human resources person so I can confess this, as you would, the biggest carrier of values in an organization, of course, is the human resources system because it deals with people. So if you attract, hire, fire, reward, recognize you mentioned engage and communicate where the culture is aligned and married yep. to the values you'll end up with a very powerful yep. culture. Yep. Uh, equally, if it's misaligned or away from each other um, and what you have on a poster on a wall is not what people can see is actually happening, yep. that m not marrying or that um, misalignment not only is just a bit of a negative thing, we now know that it actually has um, a deliberate negative effect. It becomes a detractor. People are not silly. Yeah. They know that it's lip service and it's a poster yeah. on the wall doesn't mean anything yeah. in real life. Um, and it actually ends up creating dissatisfaction and detraction. Yeah. So those people are the ones who go to their kids' soccer match and say, my place just talks the talk but doesn't walk it. Yeah. Um, so when, it's when I've seen it work together, it's really powerful, yeah. and I've seen it work the other way, yeah. is not as powerful. Uh, if you can ask yourself, for instance, um, 
if I'm willing to fire the top revenue generating salesperson in the organization because they, he or she, doesn't display the values of the company, therefore works against the culture, then you're willing to hardwire your values into the organization. And if you test yourself on those kinds of yep. ways, and you're willing to make those really hard yep. decisions, then values are very aligned with your culture. That's an interesting one, I think, to reflect on, because I just wonder how many of us would be prepared really to, really. to make a big revenue decision um, based on the values. But yeah. you know, I would hope that we're making that the decision comes out on the right side of that. Um, Piers, your environment's particularly interesting because it's, yeah. you know, it, it's a venue that hosts major events, but in amongst that, of affecting culture, I would imagine, is, is the piece around wagering and animal welfare and, and all of those sorts of things. So how do you see those external factors kind of impacting your organisational culture? Yeah, it's certainly uh, uh, an ongoing challenge, yeah. um, not just from a staff and culture point of view, but just as a um, social responsibility aspect yeah. and sponsors and, and so forth. So it's something that um, we're very conscious of and uh, that we need to acknowledge. And, and uh, while some of it's out of our control, I mean, yeah. we are mm. just the venue that um, uh, but we do we do sort of get classified in with the regulator around horse mm. racing and and so forth. So we you know we've got challenges on on big race days. Um, we have protesters out the front, which staff have to walk past and, yeah. and see, and then and then um, you know front up to their you know workplace. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think if you <coughs> acknowledge it, and we're in the process of um, rolling out a, a social responsibility plan. You educate both your staff internally, um, as well as as well as external um, companies, sponsors, stakeholders, um, and just take ownership of yep. it. You know, and but there's always going to be those people who are against gambling or against um, horse racing. Yeah. That's their choice. Um, and uh, you know, we are involved in the industry. We 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 have a choice. We 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 chosen to be involved and uh, but I think yeah accountability and just just taking ownership and, and educating around social responsibility yeah and and having the conversation I think isn't it's it's not shying away from it and when mm. people yeah. bring in their, their own concerns forward yeah being prepared to have the chat yeah and, and lay it out yeah here's what we think and here's our view and and on we go and people then are able and empowered to make a choice about whether this is somewhere that I align with That's and want right. to contribute to, or I'm yeah. going to go off and do something else. So, um, many organisations have um, inclusive inclusiveness or valuing difference up on the wall as, as part of their value statement or so forth. Um, and that, for me, that's around diversity and, and diversity of thought and so forth. In your mind, Piers, why... I mean, diversity is such a big topic at the moment, and it... it Features, you, if you uh, Google diversity, it just, I mean, it's 40 million articles you can read. I don't, I just don't get it. Why does it matter? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's about, again, it's, it's not just about people fronting up to work and, and getting paid a paycheck anymore. Um, there's so many opportunities out there, um, I think, with the world the way it is and, and, uh, the changes that we're experiencing and and consumer confidence um, being up, there is there is a, and and the, with the international borders closed, um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity out there in the workforce. So, yep. if you don't um, have a point of difference, um, if you don't, if you're not true and you don't, um, I guess, humanise those values from the from the poster yeah. and and really genuinely stand behind that then um, either you're not going to attract the, mm. the good people or um, your attention is um, yeah. is going to is going to suffer, suffer. Yeah. so uh, I mean at the ATC in terms of describing I guess our our culture and I've got there's a few staff here from um, the ATC t here today, so hopefully I get this right, including, oh, our, tell you if you're not, if you're including not. our head <laughs> of worry. people and culture, I can see just staring at me there. <laughs> um, but it's it, passionate is, is really one way in that we are, a lot of people that work 
um, at the ATC have been there for a long time and they're passionate about horse racing. It's one of those industries that you, you're, you're born into in some respects. And um, so there's a lot of people who that's been their, their, their bloodline for, yep. for so long. So there's a real um, a passion around where they work and, and pride. Yep. And we really leverage off that and we take those people and we, with, with the new young people, we sort of match them up into, into mentor programs yeah. and, and teach them about, you know, the racing industry and teach them how to be passionate about their, their job. Um, I think creating, an, creating a fun environment yeah. on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, yeah. we, we can't take life too serious yeah. and... and you know, whilst there's always a job to be done, and yeah. we all work in the events industry where it's peaks and troughs. Yeah. Um, it's, there's a time where it's, it's all hands-on, and then there's times outside of carnivals or big event days uh, where, it, where it's... But I think the key is don't take life too seriously yeah. within, the, within the workplace, and that's from a leadership point of view as well. Engage with your staff, um, you know, create... Um, programs or events which are which are fun and, and yeah. engaging for the staff and celebrate um, a bit of difference and yeah you were saying that you're you you're almost 50 50 in terms of your gender split aren't you or yes or, yeah yeah so I think um, our board's 50 50 yeah um, which uh, is outstanding so yeah, congratulations I yeah. think that's but Gail besides gender what are the other things that organise, in terms of diversity, what are the other forms of diversity or things that we should be thinking of that, that you've seen um, in other workplaces? Yeah, I think we need to be thinking of inclusivity right. um, as when we talk about diversity because if um, a workplace is inclusive, then we don't need to be as worried about streams or towers of work like uh, you know, how do we look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's participation or women's participation or people with disability having access to opportunity yeah. or people across the, range, the spectrum of sexual preferences having to be made to feel welcome. We tend to do that, but the underlying thing really is inclusivity. Um, and so before we go past gender, I just want to spend one second to 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 remind ourselves that what we're finding in organizations today is that when you do inject um, women into organizations, there are two reasons, uh, two effects that happen. One is that because they might bring different thinking into a relatively homogeneous environment, mm -hmm. we're finding that if, for instance, you put a woman on an interview panel, you instantly increase the breadth of the different types of people that may then come forward or be included into the next stage of the job process. So just, in, just changing gender representation actually opens out the whole range, whether it's multicultural or something else. And the second thing is that women have come to organizations with a, a set of skills that are now being recognized. Some of those skills are things like connection and community and a natural hardwire to in inclusivity. Yeah. So we're now in the human resources field starting to understand in the recruitment area that bringing women into those areas might actually end up that you hire uh, somebody that just thinks very differently, a male who suddenly appears into the selection process with a very different way of thinking. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Gender unlocks a lot of other things. Aside from that, we obviously see a lot of work in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait um, employee participation area, so we keep closing the gap, and then some of the other areas. And look, I see things like flexibility. Yeah. Through COVID, we now realize that people returning to workplaces get quite frustrated if they don't have the flexibility options that we had during COVID. And things like, you know, you sent us home when it suited, yeah. But now you want us all back when it suits. And well, hang on, I've now decided I don't want to pay for the tolls and drive an hour each way. Mm. And I've now actually discovered that we've actually been super productive for you as an organization. Yeah. Yeah. And now you want me back because suddenly you don't trust me again, but you trusted me mm. when you didn't want me in the office during COVID. So these kind of paradoxes that organizations are putting people through is that spectrum of inclusivity where people are saying, well, I quite like my flexibility options now. Um, we're finding things like meeting times. 
will never be considered in the same way after COVID has yeah. disrupted. We're finding now that if a meeting time starts at eight in the morning, regardless of who you are on the diversity spectrum, it may not work if you're of two family arrangement or where you are a single parent uh, and you have to drop your child at, after, at before school care or child care. I can't turn up to an eight o'clock meeting. Yeah. So that's another simple way it's actually relevant, whether it's gender or something else. It's making the workplace much more worker friendly. Yeah. People are now demanding fun, yeah. to Pierce's point. Uh, I don't, I, I'm demanding trust. Um, so this has nothing to do with yeah. whether you have a disability or you are an Aboriginal and yeah. Torres Strait Islander person. You are now saying, I want to be trusted, that I can work anywhere. I want flexibility. Yeah. I want inclusivity into my access to yeah. my career. Um, I'm seeing those kinds of things on yeah. the rise more than... How's it playing out, though? Are people, are people prepared to put their hand up and say, hey, this isn't working for me? Or, or is it um, they're begrudgingly doing as they're told? Be because it's, it's not one size fits all. It's, it's one size fits one. So what, yeah. what are we observing in that thing? So what I've observed, and it's very recent, to Pierce's point, um, I've just come out of the corporate world, and the last place I worked in, and which I'm sure all of you are seeing, a significant labour shortage right across the board in Australia, and that's an unintended consequence mm -hmm. of us being quite proud that we do COVID almost better than anywhere else in the world. So because we do it almost better than anywhere else in the world, we have a boom, but we also have closed borders and closed state borders. That's just blown out this massive attrition and significant labor shortages right across the board. What's that now showing is that the, literally within the space of say the last few months, we have seen the balance of power shift to employees yeah. very significantly. Um, I'm seeing it in the last place I worked, you know what, in Queensland and in WA, the mining companies are just offering ridiculous rates and people are just jumping in our attrition rates. Yep. In the last place I worked just skyrocketed yep. for that. So where they were begrudgingly accepting prior, Yep. They're saying, I don't need to anymore. If you don't want to give me flexibility or trust, yep. I'm just going. Yeah. And so organisations are going after um, segments of that candidate pool that previously they may not have considered They would never at have, all. because you yep. didn't have to, but yep. today we do. And it's almost that diversity now is something that we have to do. We, it's a, it's a must-have. That's, have. that's right. So, for yep. instance, we were looking at um, the non-traditional labour pools like the long-term unemployed because of this issue we face in Australia or people who are at home during the day when they drop and pick up for school. So, yep. mum and dad who stays at home, traditionally there was a labour pool that was ignored. Yep. The other very scary one, and I'll finish on this point, is that in 2025, that's not far, 75% Deloitte's tell us of the, of the people in the organization are going to be millennials. Yep. And they have, they have told us 47%, which are some of the faces here, 47% of those people have said that one of my top reasons for joining will be culture. Yep. And 74% of the people surveyed said, I believe that culture is associated with innovation. Yep. So, we're not going to get chosen anymore. No. Yeah. They're not going yeah. to choose us yeah. if we don't make some very quick changes. We've got to stand out and we've got to be attractive to yeah. that. Have you I might got yeah, I was just going to jump in because this flexible working um, paradigm is, is something which has is, is crept up on us pretty, pretty quickly. And it has. And, and every organisation is, is dealing with it differently because there's different job types and, and different skills which... Some allow you to work from home and, and some don't, don't, don't. But we've, it, being in the event world, you know, we've, I think through COVID, um, in the, the sort of senior management team in particular have, have worked from home less than 10 days. Um, yeah. So you, your interesting point around um, what other industries are doing, but more so your industry and that one size fits all, or one size fits one, you, you've got to be able to yeah. create fairness yeah. Um, in that flexible working because you've got someone who's, I mean, last time I checked, the guy who mows the lawns for the tracks can't do that from home. Um, but you've, so you've got to try and have that balance around, well, how does that person get to a work from home three yeah. days a week? But I'm here 
five days a week because yeah. that's what well, my job Requires allows. It. So yeah. there's no rule book. Very um, hairy. And it's, um, it's, it's really crept up on us. So I think that's a, a new sort of, sort of challenge around and, and the expectation around people coming into a new role now, as you said, is like, and you brought up a, a fantastic point around, well, you've trusted me to work from home when I couldn't and now you want me back. Yep. because you don't know if I'm doing my work or not. So it's interesting. Yeah, well, I think we, we trust our people come from a position of trust until we prove we can't be trusted. Yeah. We're adults. Yeah. We've, yep. we've entered into an arrangement and I'm going to do what you've asked me to do and if I don't, then, then there's consequences to that. But I think to, to both of your points is we absolutely have to start to have those conversations and managing it almost... We don't want to be doing it one-on-one, -on -one, but where there is a particular need and that person is talent, we've got to be grabbing onto them and, and making sure that we're facilitating and accommodating uh, to the extent that which we But what are. we can't do to create a positive culture is to switch on, I trust you when it suits me. Oh, that's right. And then I won't trust you yeah. when it doesn't suit yeah. me. It's not a positive yeah. work culture. Yeah. <laughs> you were an adult a minute ago, but now I'm treating yeah. you like a child and you've yes. got to come in and be supervised. It's just, yeah. Um, I do, I've got a couple of statistics here from the Diversity Council um, of Australia, and if anybody is interested, they've just released uh, a report called Counting Culture, and it makes very interesting reading. It's fabulous. But nearly half of Australians have either been born overseas or have one or both parents born overseas. We've got over 300 languages spoken in homes across the country, and more than 300 ancestries are, are um, identified. So our community, obviously, and we know this, is so diverse. But if we are not thinking about that diversity and we're not reflecting that in our workplaces, it's very hard to understand what those customers and clients are expecting from us. So we've got to kind of mirror what the community looks like so that we're aligned with community expectations, the services we might be providing, um, those sorts of things. And yeah. certainly, if you haven't got the message already, it goes way beyond gender, the, as, as you spoke to, Gail. Um, just to quickly, we, we're coming um, shortly to questions, um, to turn our attention quickly to a positive workplace culture. Is there anything happening at ATC, peers, that you would point to as particular kind of programs or things that are happening that, are, that you're really kind of proud of in terms of that culture space? Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier we've we've had a, a huge focus on um, programs, uh, not just your sort of general training and development, but mm. um, things like our quarterly company value awards. We have um, ATC Connect, which is where the entire organisation comes together on a on a quarterly basis, and we talk about a number of things. We have. Um, performance appraisals linked to our company values mm, yeah which is which is really important uh, and I think it's it's been very successful in in some of the results because <coughs> um, and those awards are, are linked to what I was talking about before collaborative care own and own and bold so yep. um, there's probably the other initiative um, just recently is um, peer-to-peer -peer nominations oh, um, and that can come from the board down to um, and you nominate your peer and you get a certain amount of points and then you can redeem those re points and, and rewards. So that's been, been really successful around not just senior management and, and the leadership team acknowledging um, and recognising, um, you know, culture and, and performance. It's, yep. you know, you can nominate the person who sits next to you yeah. or the person who's, mm. who's in another de department. Yep. And... Probably for the key thing which I didn't touch on is all of our awards, um, sorry, all of our um, values were created in workshops through our team. So yeah. again, mm. it wasn't the leadership group or the board coming down and saying, this is our values, you need to live by these values. Yeah. We engaged workshops, we engaged the staff and the creation of those values to for them to you know, take ownership and, and feel as though that yeah. that's, that's what the DNA is and that's part of it. Yeah. So um, that's, I been, love that. that's been really a, yeah. a really sort of successful um, yeah. aspect. That's awesome. I, I love that. And getting, because when values are kind of fed to you, 
yeah. then they're not your values, but if you've contributed, then at least you, you're grabbing yeah. onto them. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more about the process that the ATC went through for that, peers will be around for a little while um, at the break, so if you want to if you want to learn more, certainly um, have a talk to him about that. Um, we might open up the floor. Heather, where's, where's Heather? We yeah. Just in terms of questions, it, has anybody got anything or a comment that anybody would like to make? Um, no? Oh, yes, yes. there's yep. this one. Mm. Oh. oh I <laughs> this is not a setup, so whatever happens no, it's is not. it's not a setup. Oh, both. Yeah, thanks oh, for here that. We go. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, Wayne Middleton, Reliance Risk. I'm interested to know what your views are on vaccination policies. You know, given that the industry is striving to get back to full capacity uh, and, and clearly you know, what we're seeing now in Victoria uh, is you know, casual fleeting contacts are a point of infection, uh, given our staff will have to interact uh, with, with patrons. Uh, there's you know, obviously legal liability issues, industrial relations issues. What's the position on vaccination policies for your organisations? I can comment. Would it? Yeah, like. please yeah. go right ahead. Um, look, in the last you? place I worked at, we were not mandating it yep. because it's mired in all these complexities between yes. choice and um, between your personal choice. So, for instance, to something less controversial, the flu jabs that people tend to have in their organisations, we would make it available, um, but not force. With vaccines, now in industries I've worked and they haven't been, to be, to be clear, the health industry, but still I've come from the conduct construction industry, which is considered essential workers. The position we've taken is, at this point, that it's available, uh, encouraged, but you can't be forced. Yeah. And that's consistent with where we are. Yeah, I'll be interested to know if there's any organisations out there that are are mandating it. It's it's a, it's a little bit of a sensitive issue, isn't it? Because yeah. people have got um, a choice. People have got yeah. personal views, views or, yeah. or are against it. Yeah. So it's it's a it's yeah. a challenging one because as as important as it is yeah. for um, us as a, a nation, and it's uh, it's. It's, it can't be mandated yeah. at this point, not that I'm aware of. I don't know, Wayne, if you know, know of any organisations. No, 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 no. I would put a little asterisk on the bottom and just encourage people to check what the rules are in your area industry, yeah. and, and your industry. But certainly geographically, I know for ASM, um, across the world there are some different things happening. Um, but in Australia particularly, we are encouraging everybody strongly, uh, but we're not holding them down and, um, and giving it to them just yet. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Like the action. We're there. keeping that up yeah, our sleeve like for the, the minute. Action. And we've got another question. Hi, Beck. How are you? Thanks, Anthony. It's great to see you. <laughs> Probably uh, a question for Gail. Sorry, Anthony Duffy from VI People. Question for Gail. The, the challenges in our organisation of embedding diversity into the culture is exacerbated by the fact that we all predominantly work with casual workforces, most of whom we only engage with periodically. So I was wondering if you had, a, a, I guess, a couple of tips for people sitting in this room as to how they can uh, embed that in a culture that, that is centred around a casual workforce. Yeah, that complicates it. I suppose it depends on what you're trying to achieve, um, which is why I would reference that the more you hardwire it into the organisation, the more it does the work for you. So um, I'm not sure what you want to achieve with the casual workforce, but for instance, if we do job ads that we um, craft to attract casual workforce to us, we, I've done in the past, I've made them very neutral, gender and cultural neutral. There are some very um, good HR secret tips that use simple phrases like if you talk about remuneration in a job ad and you say um, remuneration is negotiable, that phrase we now know in HR and in recruitment instantly attracts a, a broader group of people. Number one, women don't like talking about remuneration and we know that cultures that are a little bit more modest in how they like to talk about their remuneration get put off if they have to be quite 
clear what their remuneration is. So that one phrase in a job ad that says remuneration is negotiable or open to discussion attracts a much broader group of people, just in terms of the casual workforce. We, there's software, and I don't think it's expensive, but I can come back to you. There's software that neutralizes your language. So again, you make it avail um, attractive to a larger casual workforce and makes people feel unknowingly that they're welcome. Um, there's and some it's overcoming the that unconscious bias because we write from our own position, we write, don't we? When and we're, not realise. We're writing a job ad and, and you, you reread it, but if you put it in front of someone who has a different perspective, they, don't see it they that can way. pull 15 things out of it. Yes, that are, so that one is neutralising our language, two yep. is making sure the pictures of the organisation look as broad and diverse yep. as you possibly can. Yep. Um, using phrases like that that we know in human resources attracts a broader yep. pool pool of people. I hope that helps. And peace, yeah. I was just going to add, and it's, it's a good point, and re, um, regardless of the, the casual full-time ratio, the, the size of the organisation is um, something we probably haven't touched on, but y yeah, as it's not, it's, um, it's not uh, rocket science to understand that you know, a, a, an organisation of 20 people it's, it's a lot easier to embed in a, mm. a culture and, and, uh, yes. than an organisation of some of the sizes you've worked for, Gail. Mm. So it's, you know, how do you do that? The casual workforce mm. how do, who are only there a day a week and you want yeah. them. And they're, and they're the front line as well. Yeah. They're the ones yeah. that are, you know, you want them sort of demonstrating the values. And yeah. so um, I don't have an answer well, for it, apart it, of stating the obvious it that could the be size of the organisation is... It could um, be technology-based as well if yeah. you're trying to reach a distributed remote yeah. workforce. And back into sure. your point earlier, who are your super spreaders? Yes. Identify, and, and we've all got in our casual teams, there are some people in our casual teams that we know um, are absolute advocates. They are, you know, rusted on. So, so those super spreaders can help us and be out there kind of saying the right thing, um, dropping the right messaging in for us. Um, were there any others? No? Oh. Yeah, we've got Nigel up the back. Do you want to speak loudly, Nigel? Or? You'll come closer. Okay. Just introduce. Yes, Lord have it with the hose up the back. Uh, Nigel Benton from Leisure Management. It's a question for peers about animal welfare. Um, how much do you plan for, or how much do you foresee you will be challenged by? changing fashions and public perceptions in animal welfare and horse racing in your case. My just, just an example, and it's purely an example, it's a slightly different sector, but in zoos in a generation or so, we've moved from elephant rides, which, which are now an absolute no-no and thing of the past, to very different views on animal welfare. Um, while you currently encounter a few protesters outside race meets, are you planning for a widespread change in public sentiment that would make it difficult to operate and or subsequently make the large blocks of land on which your race tracks sit uh, attractive for those who might want to use them for other purposes? Sorry, it's a bit long-winded, but no, there you go. Um, I understand the question and, and I'd like to be able to answer it in detail, but we, the, the ATC is, um, is the venue essentially, so we, we have a responsibility for um, training. We train 1,600 horses uh, on, on a daily basis across, across three of our tracks, and obviously we, we re-race um, pretty regularly, 110 times a year. So, so we have a responsibility for the welfare of, of horses whilst they're at our venue, but in terms of um, horse welfare and the retirement of horses, that's all managed by the regulator um, being, yeah. being racing in New South Wales. So we don't have a, essentially a, a, a huge control in, in, in that aspect. But obviously, as I was saying before, we're, we're accountable. So we've got to make sure our facilities are, are world class, are compliant, um, are safe. The future of racing, uh, you know, I, I don't see um, anything other than it will it, it will continue. Um, we do, we've we've got um, quite a vast amount of lands across 
um, four racetracks in, in New South Wales, which we're looking to, as we talked about earlier, around diversifying our revenue streams and creating um, 365 day a year mm -hmm. venues. But we're certainly um, planning that, that horse racing will will continue well into the future. But um, a, a lot of those, that, that sort of horse welfare and is, is really with the regulator, which, which we work closely with. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give a, a more sort of um, specific answer in relation to that. Any, any other questions from the floor? Or I'll, I'll add one in um, there back. Um, how do you know what's working and what isn't working? within the workplace? I'll, yeah. I'll jump in there. I, th I think it's um, retention. Um, we're, we're very fortunate and, and, and we've had a 6% sort of turnover the last, end, um, last financial year or this financial year. I see that changing a little bit just with the way that things are from COVID and, and with um, consumer confidence up and, and so forth. So. Um, that <coughs> retention, turnover, and and engagement is 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 a really important one, and that's engagement through. Um, uh, we do a six month pulse survey, and then a and then a annual sort of uh, engagement survey. So you get a lot of results from that. But yeah. just general day to day, as I think yeah. I talked about before, yeah. um, how people are voicing themselves in meetings, yeah. how collaborative they are. Yeah. Um, and that it, it's got to be natural. It's got to be. It's not just about a server that comes around every six months. It's about yeah. every day how you meet with your peers, how you meet with mm. your with yeah. you know your stakeholders, and it's embedding that feedback loop, sure. isn't it? It's, yeah. it's about making sure that people understand there is a way for them to have a voice and to put their hand up and say, "Hey, this thing's worrying me," or "Have you thought about?" I think that's that's important. Um, yep, we've got one more here. Oh, yeah. Can we make it work a bit we've harder? We've wheeled out, I know, three out of three. Uh, we've wheeled out the, um, <laughs> the three musketeers this afternoon, haven't we? <laughs> uh, Tim Wharton, ASM Global. Um, great, uh, great session so far, and uh, I thought uh, some great points. Gail, the, your putting of uh, putting into terms of trust, I thought was uh, was fantastic, in particular. Um, just interested. This goes to the core of uh, of culture in um, in organisations, and we've all worked in organisations where. Um, we see people working or departments working in silos. What are your best tips on how to address the issue of breaking down silos in the workplace? Does anybody want to? I'll have a okay. crack. Okay. No, 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 go. <laughs> I just love cross-functional work groups, projects. Yeah. Same. So if there's something that needs to be done, if it's a review of the staff handbook or it's a, what, what's our new uniform going to look like, get representation from across the organisation departmentally, but also from a diversity perspective. Um, the uniform decision, a great uniform decision, is rarely made by the marketing department with respect to all of the marketing departments. Uh, rarely does the marketing department make a great uniform decision. They have great input, and it's super important that they're part of that conversation, but where you can put together those cross-functional groups on any project, that's where you're going to see the silo because we start to get to know each other, we understand each other, have a bit of fun, learn, work, and come to a, um, an outcome together. That's where the silos start to um, to come down. I, th I think the other one is the the centralisation of of services. A um, couple of examples: we've established a, a project management office in the last 12 months, which has very much been around um, the PMOCs. Um, each department as their customer yep. and each project goes through there. We have complete visibility yes. um, around every project in the organisation, what the milestones are, where, where the cash flows are, um, and, and, and we treat the, the department as the customer yep. and they come in and they're the expert and expert, provide the expertise in that area. Yep. We've established a communications hub which um, has, has marketing, has um, commercial, has our PR team, yep. it also has our government relations and, and um, corporate affairs. So as, as much as you can try to centralise your operation and have a need for delegates from each area to be yep. there, that certainly helps with 
breaking down those silos. And, and probably the, the final thing I'll add there is, is, is buy into the strategy um, or, the or the mm -hmm. business plan and making sure you communicate in a very clear yes. way yep. what, what it is your organisation's trying to achieve, yep. um, whether it's a three-year business plan or a 20-year strategy. It's, it's to, to, to be able to communicate that in a way and then get complete buy-in and get everyone in on the journey will also help with that sort of centralisation yep. piece. That's Pulling in those subject matter experts is so important, I, I think. And I think across COVID, a lot of us would probably put our hand up and say, we saw those project management little committees coming together to keep things ticking. And it relied on us um, leaning on the, that expertise right across our organisations yeah. for things to happen. So, yeah, excellent. That, yeah. Yeah. Tim, does that, are you happy with that? Okay, good. Did you take notes? Because we might roll some of this out. And <laughs> um, I was just going to yes, add, whenever sorry, you sorry. can tie the success of one person to the other person's yes. success, yeah. whether it's a shared KPI or a, a thing that's bigger than each, yeah. you'll get so yeah. silos this way and you want collaboration that way. Yeah. If you make your success matter to me yeah. with a KPI, I'll very quickly cooperate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I think we're, we're, we're just what, what are you saying, Heather? Okay. Um, yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes. Did you, I, I did want to ask about quotas, I but I think we've, have we run out of time or can you do that in I, I think, one minute? No, I think we definitely have to pose that question because I think it is, it's hot. Yeah, so do quotas or representation? Well, targets? you give me the hard I'm, one. Yeah. Well, oh, I, yeah, I'm looking you. to the diversity experts. Okay, how many experts? minutes? Yeah. Right, okay. And, and You've got one minute, Gail. Oh, <laughs> one minute, geez. Okay. Do quotas work? Um, they do. Right. And look, they work, but we're resistant in Australia. Um, so if you look at Europe or India or the Asian countries, they work. Um, we're not going to like this, but one of the reasons we're now understanding from sociologists why we're a little bit resistant is because we pride ourselves from a national culture point of view that everyone has a fair go. We're a very egalitarian country, which we are. Uh, not having been born here, I can promise us that, and that we have a meritocracy. We now know that a meritocracy is a failure. It doesn't actually work. And we now know that we're 99 years away from pay parity in this country. Mm. They do work. We've just got to accept that. We know that merit principles don't work. Mm -hmm. We've got to accept the cultural cringe that, yes, we are egalitarian, yep. but you've got a circuit break, and they are the most effective circuit yep. breakers. And 30 seconds? Yeah. No, and fantastic. No. If, if you want to talk to... Uh, Gail and I and Piers spoke about quotas earlier and her position on... Um, quotas, if you're not convinced, please come and have a chat to her later because she, she will get you close to convincing. And it's I not think. shaming or blaming. Not at all it's in any just, way. Yeah. It's just it's, explaining it's the facts, better, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you both thank very you. much. You're outstanding. It's been Great. so enjoyable thank to you. share thank the stage with you. Oh. Oh.